Hey everyone, it's Lorenzo and happy holidays. Chris and I want to give you a special gift this year as a way of saying thank you for all of your support, all of the questions, all of the downloads, and all the sharing of the podcast. This special gift is the audiobook version of my book, Vision, Clarity, and Support. We've broken it up into multiple podcasts that will be less than 15 minutes each so you can hear parts of the book throughout your day. So thank you again for all of your support and please enjoy. Making the connection. Connection. Trust. If we can't connect with our team, taking the time to understand and value the things they do, talking about what's important to them, we can't create a thriving workplace. I have employees passionately involved in our community, and it's a privilege to provide them with resources that help further their cause and help spread the word. Simple encouragement can help strengthen the rapport of the entire team. One employee was starting a YouTube channel and wanted my approval. Not only was it okay, I wanted to see it. He shared it with me, and I look forward to following up on it and seeing how his current job provides content for his personal brand. By helping him connect the dots back to his role on my team, the bond becomes stronger. Everyone has a story, and my personal goal is to encourage them to go off and do their thing. I'll even help when I can. But they must remember what's right in front of them. That employee may not do much with his YouTube channel, but even as a short-term hobby, he'll improve his ability to communicate and engage others. I get to help him stretch himself, try new things, reach a goal. That's a job well done. Many of today's leaders miss this. They don't understand the need to try these new things and to be inspired. That's where connection, or the lack thereof, becomes the main issue. Tell me about yourself is no longer sufficient. We must establish that connection, and with connection comes trust. What I notice most when I look at the demographics of my team, and I bet you'll see this as well, is there's a lot going on outside of work. They're graduating from school, moving out on their own, getting engaged, married, buying houses and cars, starting families, and the list goes on. They're experiencing real life, and to be supported and encouraged through these major milestones makes a wealth of difference. We have the opportunity to provide perspective and celebrate their successes. In places that don't share a common vision or focus on connection, these moments are easily missed. The same goes for the negatives, setbacks, illnesses, deaths. We can focus solely on the work at hand, or we can be a shoulder to cry on. Which do you think will create a stronger bond within the team? A difficult shift. Who are you? Who's this person with this confidence to share analogies for days, providing people with direction and helping them connect the dots? It can be an out-of-body experience at times. And that's exactly what it's like to grow as a leader. It's a continuous transition, and each time you're given an opportunity to change, it's a chance to hit the reset button and make things even greater. People only know you by who you are today and how you do things today. The difficult part in these shifts is that we won't always get it right. I'm very connected to the people who work for me. In my earlier days of leadership, that also meant I was overprotective. I'd seek out the smallest improvements and celebrate those rather than pushing for greatness. The celebration needed to wait until we'd exceeded the needs of the job. It wasn't until we were on the brink of failure that reality set in. I was letting my team down by accepting the bare minimum. Together, we had to reform expectations and challenge ourselves to be a better team. Even now, my most significant challenge is how responsible I am for the development of my employees, what I do every day. What I role model, how I provide feedback and encouragement is completely impacting their lives. As I've gotten older and more experienced in the leadership role, I felt an even greater obligation to be sure nobody feels like just a cog in the system. They must know they're cared for, and through my actions, they must know I want them to succeed professionally and personally. When you have large teams, it's easy to focus on the top performers, the hardest workers, and those who are completely committed. Then you have the other side of the spectrum, the ones who don't meet expectations and aren't engaged in the work. These two groups can take away your focus from the third, often invisible middle ground. The employees who do the necessary work don't cause problems, but are the ones who are well aware they can work anywhere under any leader. I want them to choose me. Have I done enough? Have I made an impact on them? What are they gaining by being here? I'll be the first to admit that knowing the effect I have on the lives of my team can be eye-opening and sometimes overwhelming. In the decades I've been doing this, 
My main underlying thought pushing me to be a quality leader has been, don't let them down. We have so many people counting on us, so it's up to us to do better. We'll make mistakes, but we'll be there to see them through. We'll help everyone be stronger employees and more successful people. The reason we have leaders is to provide support day-to-day, and essentially, that's why vision, clarity, and support need to come to life. Final words. When it all comes down to it, be the leader you want. Trust your gut and do what's right. The hardest part of this work is reflecting on ourselves. We look in the mirror and ask, am I the leader for whom I'd want to work? Do my behaviors reflect the best in me? Do I understand not everyone is motivated by the same things I am? Most people in leadership roles got there through building relationships with their peers and inspiring others to get work done. Sure, some have made it into the role using aggression and verbal abuse, but that's not leadership. It's merely a job with a title, and very few people will fully engage while working for a person like that. We all recognize what we need from people is the best of themselves. When the work environment is negative, employees feel like they're just a cog in the system. They stop challenging themselves. Innovation comes to a halt. They'll do the bare minimum of what needs to be done until the day comes that they leave. Take care of your people. As you consider the pieces you've read and how the three pillars can come to life in your workplace, there will be some short-term pain as you think about your own setbacks, collect feedback from others, and come to realizations that maybe you were doing things you now consider to be wrong. It's time for that hard work to begin. This transition is an obstacle you must and can overcome. Passionate. Great leaders must dig deep to surface their humility and use it to discover why disconnects exist and how they can be eliminated to build or rebuild your team. If you've come to recognize your focus has been too much on numbers and revenue, you don't like how you've been communicating with your team, you keep losing your best people, you aren't the leader you thought you were, then it's time to get to work right now. Be happy when vision is misaligned or things aren't clear to your team. Be happy when they say they don't feel supported or empowered because now you have a starting point. Now, you can address these issues head on. Have honest conversations with your employees. Apologize, then make a game plan. Real leadership is being comfortable in uncomfortable situations. Now that we've defined and owned the wound, we have the opportunity to heal it. Redefine and restate the vision. Bring clarity into that vision and be sure everyone's expectations are clear. Then provide the right environment to support the vision and the team. Growth and improvement flow through all three pillars and, with time, things will all turn around. You'll be able to proudly boast, I am the leader I'd want to work for, coming from experience. My mother was 17 when she had me and 19 when she had my sister. Throughout the majority of my childhood, she was a single mom raising two kids and working multiple part-time jobs while putting herself through school. I remember going to work with her, being dropped off at the school's daycare, and being helped by other families. Once she remarried, we moved often. I'm talking every four years. In fact, the longest I ever lived in one city was during college. Five years, and even then I moved four times. My first real job was at my uncle's catering business. I was a dishwasher. It was labor-intensive, but it allowed me to buy my own shoes. I also worked a paper route. And here's where I pushed my first experiences in customer service to the extreme. I'd meet my customers, ask where they preferred, i leave their paper, and put the extra effort into making their experience unique. In return, Christmas would come around, and I'd find myself getting gifts and tips from these people. I prided myself in doing hard work. It's how money was made. And I quickly learned the benefits of having a positive relationship with every customer. One year, my summer job was working at McDonald's. The next year, it was McDonald's and Rite Aid. I wanted a paycheck. I wanted to show my family I was willing to take initiative and work hard. I felt this sense of responsibility to the general public and took my experiences working for my uncle and my paper route and applied them to each new role. The burgers had to be made perfect. The workspace had to be immaculate. The customers had to have a good time. I had extra coupons at the ready. I joked with the older ladies about needing to see their ID to buy alcohol when they were very clearly old enough to purchase it legally. I had fun with it, and it took all of one day at Rite Aid to earn my first raise. Little did I know, my high school experiences, my interest in serving the public, 
and my willingness to accept new responsibilities, learning everything that went with them, were the early seeds planted in my lifelong pursuit of being a quality leader. My journey to leadership. I just turned 40. That's a milestone in itself. But that comes more than 20 years of retail experience, and I've easily spent three quarters of that time in leadership roles. My very first role in leadership, though I didn't hold an official title, was at a small mom-and-pop music store in Kalamazoo, Michigan, called Music Galaxy. While working there, I was DJing at local clubs and doing college radio. I had limited knowledge of the music industry, but nevertheless, I was tasked with building the music production section of the retail store, bringing in the knowledge and resources needed to support the local community. My career aspirations were in the music industry, and this mix of jobs, DJing, radio, and retail brought everything together. They introduced me to the concepts I emphasize today about connection and meaning in the workplace, no matter the role, no matter the employee. But more on that later. After college, I moved to California and got a job at the retail mecca of music production, Guitar Center. There I worked as a guitar salesperson, and I happened to be good at it. Only I didn't play guitar. When an opportunity to be the pro audio manager showed up, I quickly snatched it. Now is the time to learn the good, the bad, and the ugly of my field. I was now a salaried employee, working long hours and leading a commissioned team who each held their own specialties but didn't necessarily work together. I brought in different vendors to customize the training, and we grew the business. Unfortunately, the fantastic general manager we started with soon left, and he was replaced by someone who only cared about numbers. He was unreliable all over the place and ended up having sexual harassment charges filed against him. A lot happened in the short nine months I was there. That's it. Nine months. I had an exceptional team and enjoyed the challenges that came with my role, but I also got a crash course in company politics, integrity, or lack thereof, and what happens when you're the one the employees turn to. I'm the one who handled HR when my female employee came to me about our GM's behavior, and I'm the one who felt a responsibility to my team when this knowledge came to light. The outcome, to me, was unacceptable, and I knew I couldn't function in a place like that. When big changes lead to big results. The next phase of my journey brought me to Best Buy, from which came a decade of leadership, growth in a variety of roles and locations. I began there part-time in the audio department, but they quickly decided they wanted me full-time. I was hesitant. At the time, I was opening a music studio in Los Angeles with some friends, and I liked my Best Buy job as it was. Easy, fun, little responsibility. I resisted the move to full-time. Management pushed harder. I relented. Now, I was in charge of the employee satisfaction team then senior of a department, and finally, when my general manager was asked to move to another store that needed help, he insisted on me transferring as well. Again, here I was kicking and screaming. I didn't want to move from my store, a simple one mile from my house to one that was unfamiliar and 22 miles of L.A. traffic away. This particular GM, Don, inspired me with his leadership style, so I went and became the supervisor of the audio department. The reset button was hit and I get to take over a team, helping them improve and align with the company's expectations. We were a two-man show, Don and I. He worked directly with the leaders setting the expectations, and I worked on the floor ensuring those expectations were a reality. Then I went on a vacation. When I returned, Don was no longer our GM, and I learned our store had been selected for a top-secret project. Corporate was seeking a new leader, someone who could innovate and empower Rather than focus on the standards, they brought in Gil. Gil turned out to be a great mentor of mine. His first day, he introduced himself and said, Someone in this room will be a better general manager than me in the future. My job is to find out who you are and help you get there. His humility mixed with empowerment made a huge impact, not just on me, but on the entire team. As wonderful as Don had been, I was excited for the changes that would come. Don was dedicated to his people as a reflection of his leadership role. With Gil, it was his life's work. The next few weeks brought new learning opportunities for both my new leader and myself. One day, Gil pulled me into his office with concerns. I need to understand something. I've spoken with everyone in this building, and nobody has any constructive criticism to offer about how you lead and who you are as a team member. 
I need to know why. For the first time, I got to fully explain my philosophies, the earliest seeds of the three pillars. Every team member needed to feel it was a team. Then there was a bigger picture and that they were doing their job for a reason. There had to be purpose and there had to be open communication. I explained it was all about development. For the most part, people want to do good work. And when they aren't succeeding, it means they need training, help, perspective, conversation. It's up to the leaders to give it to them. I told Gil my backstory and he offered me a new job. He didn't know what this job was. He couldn't know, and he couldn't tell me anything more about it unless I accepted the promotion. At the time, I was still adjusting to working at the location without my former partner in leadership. I had only moved there because I would known Don and I could do great things. Now, here I was, having to commit to a blind job under a leader I was still getting to know. I can't be like Don, no. But if you want to learn, develop, and grow in your career, I'm the guy for you. We shook hands. It was a deal. Then I was flown out to D.C. for two weeks. My flight was booked as fast as that handshake was over. One day I was Mr. Hip Hop in my Nikes and camouflage. The next, I was business casual in Washington, training to roll out a new company, Wide Philosophy. Things seemed to fast forward from there. Training, traveling, transitioning from stores to behind the scenes amongst consultants and training teams. I saw new store cultures develop. Witnessed leaders succeed, stumble, and overcome obstacles, and experienced stores all over the country. From one coast to the other, I found myself in the southeast U.S., and then I took my biggest leap. I built a house in Jacksonville, Florida, and made a transition from 10 successful years with Best Buy to day one with Apple, Inc. I'm in my 10th role of, in my opinion, being the person who is ultimately accountable for the results, development, and experience of individual stores. It's a career filled with mistakes, new lessons, and constant change. I work in service of my employees and of the three pillars, vision, clarity, and support. These are the essential tools needed to ensure your employees can be their best. This book is your friendly operational manual. Rinse and repeat. The work won't be done once you've established the three pillars in your workplace. There will be times when you experience a bad quarter. You're struggling to meet a budget or your own direct leaders don't think you're meeting expectations. These old wounds seem to resurface, but we can stop, recommit, and consider the actions we need to take next. The leader needs a leader, too. When we consider the three pillars, we must also look upward. Are we getting a clear, aligned vision from our own leaders? Are our roles and expectations clear? Have we clarified what we need from them? Is the support there? Do we know what resources are available to us, and are we using them? Take on the challenge of creating the world you want. Are you working in an environment that allows you to be your best self? And if that environment can't be built and maintained, then consider the hardest question of all. Is it the right place for you? Or are there other industries or jobs where you can more easily be the leader you want to be? It takes a lot of emotion, transparency, and discomfort. But by doing the right work trusting your instincts, being a positive force, and truly caring about those you work with, you'll get through all these obstacles much quicker. These three pillars are yours now. You've reached the end of this crash course on the three pillars of success. If you haven't already, it's now time to take what you've learned and apply it to your own work environment. What changes can you make? How can you inspire and re-energize your team? Shifting the focus to a unified vision? There's always room for improvement, and it's never too late to start. As you become the leader you've always wanted to be, you'll inspire those among you to do the same. Imagine a new generation of workplaces where teams are empowered, aligned, and connected, and where productivity is high, customers are happy, and turnover is low. Now, make it happen. The conversation continues online. Follow the Hacking Your Leadership podcast and hear co-hosts Lorenzo Flores and Chris Stark address your leadership questions. No role plays, only real talk. Chris and Lorenzo share four decades of experience to help you become a more effective leader. New episodes every Monday and Thursday.